please welcome to the stage, Jake Bright. Hello, Traverse City. Today, I'm going to connect TEDxTC's theme of re-evolution and four C's of community, contribution, courage, and citizenship to Africa. I wrote an award-winning book on Africa called The Next Africa with co-author Aubrey Ruby. And in the book, we detail some things that you probably haven't associated a lot with Africa. We talk about how business, technology, entrepreneurs, innovation, and innovative leaders are transforming the continent of Africa. But before we go to Africa, I want to anchor some of those four C's right here in northern Michigan. My path to Africa actually started right here and out into the world, started right here, literally almost right here. Uh, I grew up in Traverse City. I went to high school uh, like that right next door at Traverse City uh, Senior High School. Our parents' business, my brother and sister are here, was right down the street within walking distance. And uh, before I got on track academically, um, I actually wasn't the greatest student in the world. And I wasn't that interested in school, and I actually started to get into a little bit of trouble here in the community. And the four C's uh, that this uh, event is, is themed after really came uh, online to get me on track. So one of the first places that I really saw courage and contribution was in um, our family business. Uh, my parents founded Mabel's, and we grew up working there. And I watched my parents defy a lot of odds to found a successful business and employ almost uh, 50 people for almost 30 years. And I also saw, uh, growing up in the business, what courageous entrepreneurs can do, what kind of contribution they can have uh, to communities when they operate well-run businesses. Uh, when it comes to Traverse City's public school systems, I owe a lot um, there, and there was a tremendous amount of citizenship and community that kicked in through some great educators, too many to, no to note. But, for example, Betty Leuenberger was my ninth grade civics teacher, who was the first person that took me abroad and helped me find my interest in international affairs. The first idea I had to visit Africa was actually when uh, Lynn Salathiel and David Parrish showed the movie Cry Freedom from South Africa in 11th grade. So by 12th grade, I'd gotten my act together, and I decided that um, I wanted to go and pursue an academic and career path in foreign affairs, and less than one year later, here I was in West Africa for the first time on a university program, and have continued to go back and weave Africa into my career from the White House to Wall Street to business news. Uh, so the four C's did a lot for me here in Traverse City. Now let's go to Africa. So I want you to kind of, if you, if you have any preconceptions about Africa, I want you to clear a completely different memory space today. Because my goal is to overwhelm you with things and trends and people that are completely different than things you've heard about Africa. And it's important to note, I'm going to generalize, and that's very informed by data and also by Africans themselves. It's a huge continent, 54 countries, 48 in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, a billion, two people. But in the past, Americans probably haven't related to Africa that much, if at all. Maybe a friend who did Peace Corps, maybe a donation to a celebrity charity. And one of the reasons why Aubrey Ruby and I did our book is because we were starting to see cross-cutting trends in Africa's business, and Africa's politics, and its demographics that led us to see that Americans in the world are going to interact very differently with Africa in the future than they have in the past. So let's jump into that. A big construct um, to take with that is that Africa is going from this position of being very globally disconnected to connecting. Uh, and we call it shifting from this 3%, less than 3% reality. So when you look at the globalized world, a lot of things that connected um, a lot of the world and globalization digitally and through trade and economics, they passed Africa by, and there's this less than 3% reality. Any category, Africa has had less than 3% of global trade, less than 3% of global Google hits, less than 3% of foreign direct investment. So Africa has been shifting from that era of disconnect to connecting, and that's gotten the attention of a lot of big global business, especially from 2010 to 2015. Global business really started to focus on Africa. There was a thousand percent increase in Google News hits with Africa and business associated terms, and almost every forward consulting firm like McKinsey and Accenture has done um, you know, presentations or reports on what's going on in Africa. So why? 
What's been driving business uh, buzz on Africa? There's four reasons I can break down. The first one is economic growth and reform. Uh, when a lot of the world was reeling from recession, Africa was showing the fastest growing economies in the world, and also a lot of reform. And this is a picture, actually, of an Ethiopian manufacturing plant that's uh, pulling manufacturing from China now. The second reason businesses started to really focus on Africa is investment. Billions of dollars have been pouring into Africa in investment, 55 billion over the last couple of years in foreign direct investment, which moved Africa out of that less than 3% reality, and it has more than 3% of global FDI. So you have GE moving into Africa, Ford's manufacturing cars in Nigeria, a lot of investment. Um, the third thing that's really gotten to focus on Africa is demographics. If you look at milestones in demographics, um, almost any category, Africa is in the top three. Um, fastest growing population in the world, fastest urbanizing population in the world, um, you know, fastest you know, youth population in the world. So we interviewed uh, Africa's richest man, Aliko Dangote, and he said that for businesses, no matter what you think about Africa, you can't ignore the numbers. And the fourth reason why Africa has been getting so much attention in global business is modernization. Uh, the continent does have some of the worst infrastructure in the world, but that's also a tremendous opportunity. There's, trillion, there's billions of dollars going in to upgrade Africa's infrastructure. Everything, roads, bridges, power, uh, and also ICT infrastructure, information communication technology, which leads me to another big part of Africa's re-evolution and transformation, and that's tech. So Africa has a burgeoning tech movement starting to you know, come online very strong now. Um, across the continent, there's a new tech culture. Um, there's a, a number of things that are starting to form and flesh out an African technology ecosystem. The first one is uh, innovation centers. So these are venture capital-backed centers uh, that are, and also grant-funded centers, that are starting to do all kinds of things in technology. Uh, their startup entrepreneurs are coming and getting mentoring for their businesses. Africans are learning coding in some of these uh, hubs. They're visiting with CEOs. Uh, Google CEO Eric Schmidt's been to some of these. The most famous African, um, or well-known African innovation center is iHub in Kenya, which has launched 156 companies and also has 20,000 members. Uh, another big part of Africa's tech ecosystem is startups. Uh, startups are popping up everywhere and starting to find application, or try to find application in this huge informal economic space of Africa. So there's startups, it's almost like the U.S. in the 1990s in its own way, where there are startups starting to do everything. Um, one example is actually Chris Fillan, um, who's a Nigerian entrepreneur, um, who founded Mall for Africa, which is an e-commerce startup. And entrepreneurs um, are also starting to sprout up in Africa, and a lot of them are coming from the U.S. A lot of them have studied in the best schools in the U.S. and also worked in companies, and they're dropping out now. We call them white-collar dropouts to leave jobs in the U.S. and go back and do startups in Africa. Um, the other big thing that's funding startups is investment. So we've documented a, around a billion dollars in venture capital going into African startups from Goldman Sachs, from European private equity firms, from Silicon Valley. Um, and then you're starting to see regional tech hubs uh, come online in Africa, meaning countries and areas that are known for technological innovation, one of those is Kenya. Um, Kenya has become known as a global tech hub. It's called Silicon Savannah, largely for its mobile money innovation called M-Pesa. Kenya is the leading place in the world now um, for mobile money. So you now have Africa being known, and parts of Africa being known for technological innovation. So expect tech in Africa to start to move into everything and perhaps have more impact faster across more sectors than anywhere in the world, education, politics, business, you name it. Um, and behind all these numbers and, you know, this re-evolution theme in Africa, it's not just numbers, it's not just economics, it's not just GDP statistics. Behind that are people. And people are driving these things. And perhaps one of Africa's most overlooked resources has been its people. And when you look in Africa on the continent, and then also in the diaspora, the global population of Africans abroad, you're starting to see Africans emerge and surge in almost every category you can possibly think of and it's reversing brain drain and shifting archetypes. So I'll just go through some examples. And these are just a handful. Um, we interviewed hundreds of entrepreneurs like this. So Tayo Oviosu is a Nigerian entrepreneur who went to uh, Stanford for his MBA, was at Cisco, dropped out of all that, has moved back to found Paga Payments, which is like the PayPal of Africa, 
Um, he now has 10,000 agents across Africa, and in 2015 uh, transferred a billion dollars in, in digital finance. A lot of people don't know that Nigeria has the second largest film industry in the world called Nollywood. And Kunle Afoyan is one of the well-known directors in that field. And if you go home tonight and go on Netflix, you can watch his films on Netflix right here in Traverse City. Many people are familiar with Lupita Nyong'o, the Kenyan actress. Uh, Duro Oluwowu is a fashion designer who's one of Michelle Obama's favorite designers. Uh, an example of courage and citizenship is Omiyale Shaware, who founded digital media site Sahar Reporters, which tackles corruption on the continent and names and shames uh, corrupt officials and against uh, death threats and all kinds of threats. Shaware and Sahar Reporters has outed corruption all over the continent, had people go to jail, and had people be removed from public office for stealing public funds. Um, you have Just a Band, which is a great Kenyan band. It's been featured by the New York Times. It's very eclectic Afro-funk fusion. They're great. And one of the most um, you know, innovative examples, or I guess inspirational examples, when you get into the potential of Africa's youth, goes back to tech. You have Kelvin Doe, uh, who is a young Sierra Leonean, who became a YouTube sensation when his invention, he won an innovation contest where he created his own digital radio station in Freetown, Sierra Leone, uh, manufactured out of pieces of scrap and garbage that he found walking home from school. Calvin ended up becoming um, MIT's youngest visiting practitioner in the history of the school, and he also was one of the youngest TED speakers ever. Um, so moving along to charity, um, there's this phrase, for Africa by Africans. And in the past, you may have associated charity more with uh, outsiders, you know, the Gates, the Geldofs. Well, now what you're seeing is Africa's kind of Carnegie, Rockefeller, um, their own Carnegies and Rockefellers are emerging and starting to take charge of Africa's altruistic agenda. So I'll just give you a couple examples. Aliko Dangote, Africa's richest man, has founded his own charity uh, and endowed it for a billion, too. A Zimbabwean uh, telecoms executive, Strive Masaiwa, has his own, his own charity. He's uh, helping African orphans, and he's sending high-potential Africans to school in the U.S. on scholarship, including to Harvard. Patrice Motsepi, another African philanthropist, a mining mogul from South Africa, has his own charity uh, that, that deals with poverty alleviation, and he joined the Giving Pledge with billionaires like Bill Gates and Mike Bloomberg, who have committed to give half of their wealth away by the end of their lives. So, you know, no more uh, poor Africans need help. A lot of Africans are now starting to help their own. Um, and, you know, a big deal with this re-evolution theme and transformation theme in Africa is connecting it to the U.S. And it's actually not an ocean away. Africa's transformation story and a lot of these four C's that I'm talking about that are starting to take place on the continent and amongst Africans, it's actually becoming a new American immigrant story. Uh, African immigrants of the past two decades, uh, in the United States especially, have started to become very successful very quickly. This is a photo of saint Cez, uh, 116th Street in Harlem, where the Senegalese over the last 20 years, immigrants, have rejuvenated that entire neighborhood. Uh, this photo in the middle is Redeemed Christian Church of God North America, which is a Nigerian church that actually is in North America. They become the fastest growing congregation in the United States. And here's one for you to really kind of reshape paradigms and talk about citizenship and contribution. These African immigrant Nigerians for RCCGNA in the U.S. are now going into poor American neighborhoods to do missionary work. So, you know, take that one. Um, the other thing that's, that's been, um, you know, a big factor for African immigrants is there's been a high premium placed on, placed on education because a lot of these immigrants are leaving places where there weren't educational opportunities. So the premium's been placed. Uh, and you're seeing that, and here's another great factoid about the African, contemporary African diaspora in the U.S. Um, we checked the Census Bureau, and by 2012, the highest educated demographic in the United States of America are African immigrants of the last two decades. That's not the highest educated immigrant population, that's the highest educated demographic of any demographic in the entire United States of America. Down here in the corner is um, a photo of Sahili Ibrahim, and a headline like this comes up just about every spring in New York when college acceptances come back. Sahila is a Nigerian immigrant, first generation, whose parents live in New Jersey. And she made headlines in CNN when she became, and this keeps happening, happened this spring too. 
She got accepted to every single Ivy League school, all eight Ivy League schools, and she accepted at Harvard, and she got invited to the White House. And another very telling statistic is that African immigrants, and it really talks about how much capacity this population has, African immigrants sending money home, remitting money uh, through Western Union or, or, or whatnot, they're now sending home more money, African immigrants are sending home more money than the entire foreign aid uh, for, for the entire continent, which I think says a lot about how paradigms are shifting and um, you know, the capability of, of Africans with the right environment. And you're also seeing that become a new link for business and investment in the U.S. A lot of money's going home to actually fund some of these startups. So some concluding points, you know, I want to stress that challenges are absolutely going to remain in Africa. Um, you know, it's, it's a place with humans, and humans, wherever humans are, you have steps forward and steps back, like China. Like the U.S., we continue to have progress and you know, we, we had our own kind of trial period. But you're finally entering a, an era, we think, where these collective trends are going to come together, where finally Africa will not be this, this disconnected, marginalized continent that you only associate with charity and poverty. You're going to see an era where Africa's progress finally starts to overshadow its problems. And to connect that to you in one concluding point, what this means to you, in the future, uh, Americans are going to be more likely to have African stocks in their 401ks, more likely to use or hear about African tech innovation, to watch Nollywood films on Netflix, to download uh, iTunes songs from, from Kenya, and you'll definitely be more likely to be hearing lots of new African names and learning more African names in the future than just Barack Obama and Nelson Mandela. Thank you. <laughs>